Morning, everybody, and I want to add my happy Mother's Day to everybody else's salutations. So happy Mother's Day. Can we, that are not mothers, thank our mothers with a round of applause? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I got a real neat treat today. I want to be able to take a second and welcome my favorite mother in the house, my wife, the mother of this church, glory to God, Amy Wiseman. Can you thank her? Yeah. Come on up here, baby. Today, we have an opportunity to share together. And some, some Mother's Days, Amy shares on our own. Sometimes we have other ladies, like Pastor Stephanie, I think, did last year. And today, we want to bring a word together for you guys. Um, Amy and I do. We want to bring a word. And so, how many, how many know um, this is our fourth and final week in our Impossible Made Possible series? And today, we're going to be looking at it's seeing the impossible made possible in your relationships. That's what we're going to be looking at. And before we get into that, you know, I, I know you've seen this, this Slack line. How many ever done Slack lining? Anybody? Marianne Boggs, you have not Slack lined? I am so surprised. <laughs> no, I would think better of you. No, I'm kidding. But, but no, it's like the slack line. This is, a, this is something that you have tension, you know? And, um, and so in life, there's a lot of tension that we deal with in life, you know? And so today we're gonna be looking at kind of that resolution of tension. And I've been actually practicing really hard. And so you guys ready for this? Stretch your hands towards your pastor. <laughs> Intercede. Okay, Ready? Here we go. No, I'm kidding. Ain't no way. <laughs> ain't, ain't no way. Did that make you a little tense? Actually, though, the truth matters. Amy's been practicing, and she has the, the, the form for it more than me. And so, baby, try this out. Like, like show them how, how this. Yeah, go, girl. Do you want to see it, really? Yeah. All right. I'll help it's not you get that up. hard. I'll help you get up. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> I am not getting up there. No, there's... <laughs> There's no way. There's no way. Uh-uh. It's not happening. Oh, it is not happening. No. <laughs> but in life, there's times where we'll feel tension. Yeah. We'll feel that stress, that impossible thing that you just, it's so emotional. It's almost like you cut the knife with it. And so I want to look at tension today, and, um, and we'll get into a few things that help resolve tension in our lives. And um, this is a Mother's Day sermon, because I don't know about y'all, I think mothers probably face the most tension of anybody in the world, you know? They got to deal with a husband, they got to deal with kids, they got to deal with just that worrying, you know, um, motherly nature about their children and all those things. And so I want to define tension for us. That's, you know, usually the way I like to teach is I like to bring some definitions of things in. And so it's the state of being stretched tight. Exactly. Like I said, this is a Mother's Day sermon. You know, that stretching of your, of your life. I mean, there's nothing like that um, that a mother faces. But, but, you know, we can call that tenseness or stress or strain. You know, I know I can come home at times and I can just see that on my, my girl's face. You know, she's been strained and, and that's, um, his name is Maverick. <laughs> you know, it's the state of having um, muscles or tendons Stretch tight. How many's ever had like a tight calf muscle? Yeah, yeah. Tight hamstring, you know. Your neck is a little stiff. That tension that you feel, it causes that strain. It causes that discomfort. Keep those things in your mind. Strain, discomfort. Okay, keep that in your mind. The second definition that I've seen with tension is mental or emotional strain. I think you already were making those connections, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. That emotional, that anxiety, that pressure, that worry, agitation, edginess. I'm not tense. <laughs> How many said that? Your wife's like, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. He just chews on the side of his lip. I can tell. I was like, oh, it's, it's the truth. She's like, good. what's going on? Nothing. And she knows, like, I don't even know I'm doing it. Like when I'm tense, I guess I, I chew on my lip. And so uh, <laughs> all those things. But listen, like for as bad as we can feel with intent, like tension, we have sure come up with some adorable ways to call tension. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Things like jitteriness, the butterflies. That sounds cute, you know. For what I'm feeling, it's not butterflies. Um, the heebie-jeebies, the willies, the shakes, the gym jams. That has to be an English one. I look these up. I'll have the gym jams. <laughs> well, that sounds delicious. <laughs> you know? This, is a, this has to be another English, English one. The collie wobbles. Ooh, that sounds good too. 
And then the final one I've heard before, the yips. I got the yips, you know. So we come up with a lot of fun ways of saying the, the tension, but it doesn't feel ten, It doesn't feel fun. Um, it, it, some of the ways we feel tension, we feel it in our finances. I'm going to say again, for mothers, you feel it in scheduling, trying to, to balance all things. I can remember doing a counseling session with a young man, and um, one of my questions is, should the wife work once she has children? And he had put, absolutely, you know. And then it got to the housework part, and he had everything that you would do around the house, he had said he wouldn't do. <laughs> and there's a name that you call people like that, divorced. <laughs> yeah. No, but <laughs> just that wife has a full-time job. If she's working outside the home and in the home, I commend you. You know, if she's just working in the home with the kids... I commend you. That might even be harder. I don't even know. But the thing about that is when it comes to tension, um, those are all areas of tension. But the, probably the biggest area of tension that probably feels the most tense is relational tension, tension relationships. You, you see this, and it's about maybe 18 to 24 inches off off there. And, you know, you felt that tension a little bit when I went to step up on it. Actually, you probably felt that sense of, I'm going to so laugh. But you felt that tension for Pastor Amy when she went to come up. because like, you like her better than me. <laughs> but you know what? When it comes to finances or agendas, that's one thing. But I want you to watch something because this is what it's like with relational tension. It's almost 900 feet. Now, you have to understand, this man does not have a rope. This is a free slack. Nothing tying him to that slack line. His mama wouldn't be happy. in the world. Oh my gosh. Are your hands sweating? I'm mine too. I've seen it like probably eight times. Whew, I showed that to Amy a few days ago. I was like, we're using this this weekend. And she's like, oh, she's like, my hands are sweating. That's the response. That's that sense of fear, that sense of tension that like, what in the world are you thinking of? Uh, what I want you to notice though, when he's going across the slack line and experiencing that tension, what was his posture? Think about that. What was his posture? He was so focused on what the tension there, you know, and he should be, right? But he's so focused, his posture is heads down. He's not looking around. I mean, that's a beautiful environment to look around in. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, that's absolutely gorgeous, but he's looking at this line. That's, he, he's just focusing on the tension. That's what he's focusing on, focusing on this right here. So he's not getting a full picture of his surroundings at all. He is just focusing on this little two-and-a-half-inch piece of strip going across that wide chasm. Listen, tension, when it comes to relationships, it will always cause you to struggle to see and get the big picture. That's why you fight. That's why you get frustrated. You don't understand. You're not seeing it the way I'm seeing it. You're not hearing me. You're not listening. You're not, it just, that tension causes us to be very difficult to get a big picture. We hyper-focus. We become very myopic, and we look closely at what we're dealing with right here, and that's it, but we don't get the big picture of maybe where the other person's coming from. And what that does, that leads to friction. That leads to antagonism. 
that leads to hostility. Yeah. And so tension, we've given two definitions. I'll give you a third definition of tension. Tension is a state of strained relationship. It's a strained state or condition resulting from forces acting in opposition to each other. Think about this. They're being pulled. It's being pulled in opposite directions. And when we have relational strain, relational tension, we're not seeing the big picture, and we begin to pull in our own direction. We begin to pull opposite from each other. Now, I don't want you to think this sermon is just for married couples. It's not. After this service, for second, first service, I had three different people come up to me and explain the relational tension they're having. None of them were with their spouse. And the sermon was reaching them, you know. So this isn't just marital relationships, although it's a Mother's Day sermon. This is all relationships. That tension can come in and it can begin to rob us of the big picture. And it can begin to cause us to live with anxiety and hostility, etc. It begins to take from us. And I want to look at the word. I like, again, I like definitions. So I started to look, what's the origin, origin of that word um, um, tendon? And I begin to see that in the Latin, it comes from tendere. Tendere, which means to stretch. And when I read tendere, my brain thought, that sounds like tendon. And guess what? I found out it's the same root. So to stretch, that idea of that ligament or that tendon, those parts of the body that stretch to cause the body to work. But those parts of the body can be injured. Those parts of the body can be strained as well. And so the Greek word tenon, T-E-N-O-N, became in the mid-century, mid-1500s, the word in medical use, tendon. It became the use of the word, of the English language, tendon, you know, or some would say sinew, okay? And so I want to bring that idea of tension and tendon back to relationships, because I think relationships and tension, they go hand in hand, or foot and ankle, maybe. Maybe we should say it that way. And so in Genesis 2, 23, it says, Then man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So you see a husband and wife, bone of bone, flesh of flesh. There's this deep connection. And anytime there's that kind of connection, there can be injury. Anytime there's that connection, there can be something that gets pulled in that body, if you will, and strained in that relationship, right? Never happens to you and I, never. Ephesians 4, 16, it says, from whom the whole body, now it kind of talks about other relationships, and this is speaking to the church, but I love this, whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with with, with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I mean, you can see that in the relationship in your home or in the church or with anybody. It's, it's, you're knitted together, if you will, by those tendons and joints and ligaments and all those sorts of, of things coming together. And so when the relationship is strained, unresolved conflict starts to bring external tension at a level that is it's frustrating, it's scary, it's can we get past this? I'll never let you forget this. You'll never do that to me again. They'll never treat me that way, ever. If that's how they are, I'll take my ball and I'll go home. Whatever it is when it comes to the relationship, just that idea of that tension, I feel like it's, it's, it's I think Scripture is really speaking to the idea of, 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 of relationship. And here it's telling us that if, if we'll work properly, it makes us grow in love. And so, you know, talking about working properly, um, Last, I think it was the end of August, 1st September, I was coming down the stairs at my house. And, um, and normally I don't look at my stairs. I just kind of fly down. I actually, I put my hand on this thing and I put my hand on the handrail and I just kind of float down. You just imagine that. It's a beautiful thing. And I'm, ah. um, But this morning, for whatever reason, I was walking down the steps and I was looking at my feet, which I never do. And I have bifocals. How many know when you have bifocals? Things look different down here. So I'm looking down, I go one step, two step, trip, barely touch the third step, and jump. And I'm barefoot, and I jump all the way down, I, I want to say six more steps. And I land on my right foot, and, um, and I, I, from dirt biking days, I can dive roll. I mean, we call it a jelly roll, but I can dive roll the best of them. 
And so I land on my foot, and I just dive rolled, and I rolled into my living room. I stood up. <laughs> my dog, oh. <laughs> nobody was there. And, um, <clears throat> and I didn't think nothing of it. You know, I go about my day. Man, two nights later, I get up in the middle of the night and head into the bathroom, and I put one foot out of the bed, and the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life, in my heel and in the sole of my foot. I thought, oh my gosh, what, have I, what did Amy do to me while I was sleeping? So I didn't think nothing of it, but it just kept, it kept hurting. I, could, I didn't know what was going on. I don't go to the doctors. I just never like doctors. So, I mean, I should, but I don't. And so I'm just dealing with it, thinking, ah, I've heard it. It'll be fine. And about a week later, I asked a couple of my friends, have you ever experienced this? And one of them says, have you landed on your feet hard lately? Yeah, my foot, not my feet, my one foot, all of my weight. And he said, you've got plantar fasciitis. I didn't know about this. So the plantar fascia runs underneath your foot and attaches to your heel on the front side of your heel. And then your Achilles tendon comes to the back side of your heel. And it creates that thing that works properly. But when my foot flattened out so fast, it pulled my fascia so hard that it actually pulled a little bit of the bone away from my heel. And it created like a little bone spur. And man, that's affecting everything. That hurts so bad, you know? And so the falling down the steps, what happened? It resulted in an injury that shaped how I started to walk. And the next thing you know, it started causing my ankle or other things, let's just think of it that way, to become aggravated. And so I've done a lot of hiking since I did that. But about two months ago, for whatever reason, same mountain we hiked about a month before that, no issues. But for whatever reason, that day, eight mile hike, in my last three miles, my ankle stiffened up like I sprained it. It began to bring restriction and issues in other areas of my body. <clears throat> And because of this injury, my foot, what will happen, the doctor explained, it becomes inflamed and it becomes tender and it makes it very hard to go forward as usual. And that's the way it is in a relationship. There's injury that takes place. I've injured you and I'm sorry. I mean, there's been times, you know, you've injured me. <laughs> this is when you go, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I received that. And, um, but it does, it starts to affect other areas of your life, you know, it begins to affect things. So when I was with the doctor, I'm like, what's the fix, you know? And so he explains to me, you're going to have to do four exercises a day or four exercises six times a day. And then twice a day, I want you to take a, a bottle, a Coke bottle, freeze it. And I want you to roll your foot on that for five minutes, two times a day. And so I bought me a Coke bottle. I got wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you do with the Coke bottle? I'm sorry, this isn't in the notes. What do you do with that Coke bottle after you're done rolling it on your foot on the floor? I put it in the freezer. Ew. <laughs> Have you been doing that? That's the frozen bottle in the freezer. I thought that was a new one every time. <laughs> Why would it be new? It Why takes hours to freeze a bottle. That's disgusting. I clean it off. I actually have oh. one in the church freezer, too. <laughs> In the first service, Stephanie's like, This is what? not okay. <laughs> I was oh. getting it from both directions. But, okay, that's not that. That's so not sorry. the point. So sorry, guys. But here's the thing. Listen, there's, there's a point to this, woman. <laughs> These will be exercises that he says I'm going to have to do throughout my life in order to avoid the inflammation and the re-stiffening of my fascia and my Achilles tendon. And in other words, this original injury, there's something I'm going to have to do to keep that area soft and pliable for the rest of my life, or it'll become inflamed, and then it'll cause me to move forward differently and begin to affect other areas of my structure, right? And so um, it's to, and what that exercise is to do is to stretch the tendon and fascia, like I said, so it doesn't become inflamed. And um, when that happened, you know, that, that original damage was done, I can't fix the original damage. That, that's what happened. That accident happened. That incident happened. But I can manage it going forward. So the only way to heal from the damage now is for me to loosen everything up and not let that tension remain. Now, when it comes to relationship, listen, it's easy to get hurt and stay stiff in your resolve to hold anger against another. But this doesn't bring the healing and release of tension that you need. Not one bit. You need exercise emotionally, if you will, just like I had to physically, you need to exercise too if you're going to free up from the tension and inflammation you have because of the injury put upon you by another person, all right? 
And guess what that exercise is? Let me use, let me, let, let, we're going to talk a little bit about that exercise. What that exercise that you're to use that will give you the release of tension, it's the exercise of, and you're going to hate this, the exercise of forgiveness. And I know it doesn't sound real deep. It's one of those principles that may sound shallow, but it's deep to live. That's the thing. And that exercise of forgiveness, God will use that to release the tension that you have with other people. In Mark 11, verse 25, it says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that you, your Father in heaven, may forgive you your sins. And there's three quick things I can see in this that I think are worth mentioning. The first, so that you may have your sins forgiven. Sin, whether sin was perpetrated by you in that relationship or sin was placed upon you, like they sinned against you, all I know is this, sin hardens hearts, period. Sin perpetrated against you will harden your heart if you let it. Your sin towards somebody, if you don't deal with that, it'll harden your heart. Sin hardens hearts. And we've already seen how important it is for our heart to be pliable. Uh, The other thing I see here, it says, and when you stand praying, when, that word when, it alludes that this is to be a practice in your life. And when you stand praying, not if you stand praying, no, when you stand praying. Like this should be something you do often, standing before the Lord, speaking to God on behalf of what's going on in your life and the lives of others. So it says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive. So in other words, it should be a daily practice or a daily exercise when it comes to prayer that if there's need to be, there should be a daily exercise of forgiveness. And here's the thing about that. The exercise of forgiveness, do you see the other person in this other than to forgive? They're not in the conversation. When you stand praying, you're talking to your father, and your father's doing a work, a work in you. So when it comes to forgiveness, the exercise of forgiveness is more between you and God than you and the one you have tension with, you know? Sometimes, especially with those narcissistic folk, they love the tension you have with them. It gives them their dopamine drop. Oh, let's keep stirring things up with you. Man, free that power. Don't, don't, don't let that power have its hold over you. Back up. Deal with the Lord and release that, you know? And so the exercise of forgiveness isn't something offered to change the stiff heart of the one who wronged you. No, it's offered to keep your own heart soft and pliable so further damage will not be done. And so be able to live, and we'll come back to this at the end, but be able to live with a heart of forgiveness with those that are causing you tension. And that's kind of external tension. But the thing is, you're dealing with this externally with somebody, there's a whole lot going on on the inside, right? Like, like it might be an external fight, but it's an internal conflict as well within yourself. And so Amy's going to share a little bit about an exercise, a tool that you can use to help with that inner tension, that internal tension. Yes. So I would like to know who my firstborns are in the room. Could you raise your hands? Yes. Okay. I see you and I get you. You are my people. I'm a firstborn and I don't know about you, but I hate being wrong. I hate being wrong. I love being right. I work really hard to be right so I don't have to be wrong because I hate to be misunderstood. So because of that, I have learned to use scripture to my benefit. (laughs) This is going to be good. So let me teach you some good spiritual application that will probably damage more of your relationships, but it's fun to, to tease about. So Early on in marriage, it was easy, you know, when I was feeling that internal tension to just be like, look, just follow me as I follow Christ and no one gets hurt. (laughs) So clearly I'm right. So just follow what we're doing. Okay. So that didn't go over too well. So, but I do have another one. I I like the verse that talks about. I was going to say Paul was single too. Oh, ouch. That is true. So I do have another one and that is don't let the sun go down on your anger. And that's impactful. That is a good Mm -hmm. principle to live by because you want to resolve that anger and that tension. And so let's do it in a timely way. So don't let the sun go down on your anger and keep harboring that day after day. So it was easy to say, look, I need to hold you emotionally hostage because I'm still angry and I haven't felt understood. So we need to keep talking and you're not going to bed. (laughs) Literally. (laughs) 
<laughs> Literally, the anybody first else? years of marriage. Man. Do I have anybody else that's done that? Please 5 a.m. in hand. the morning, the sun is coming up, and we did not go to bed on our anger. <laughs> but I was being biblical. <laughs> I was being biblical. Uh, so that was before kids. All right. After kids, it was more like, look, I need my sleep. So I tell you what, I'm going to choose not to be angry that you're wrong, <laughs> and we will take care of this when I wake up. That's the truth. That's the truth. <laughs> Children don't try this at home, or adults. But no, what, what is with that? Why, why do I feel like I have to be right all the time? As a firstborn, and I'm sure you know, it's not just a characteristic of being a firstborn, but what makes me need to be right, not so much for to win the argument, but it's important for me because it makes me feel heard and understood, mm -hmm. you know? And when you're wrong, it's almost like you're just, no, you're wrong. Case closed, end of story. And you just kind of go away frustrated. And that is where that internal frustration kind of gets to you. And, um, you know, one of the things I see it as is an impossible impasse. And what that is, is it's a situation in which no progress is possible, especially because of a disagreement or a deadlock. So does having in relationships that deadlock, do you feel that at times? Don't raise your hand because you might be sitting next to a deadlock. <laughs> but it's a very real thing. You, you kind of want to skirt around it. You kind of, that tension makes it either like you, you really don't want to deal with it or you kind of go around it. But the truth is, anything worth fighting for means you're going to have to walk through it. Mm -hmm. This is a biblical principle. And this is one that's actually taken in context in the Bible. <laughs> um, but no, this is where the power of confession comes in, guys. It helps us deal with unresolved tension. The definition of confession is to tell or make known something that is wrong or damaging. And again, that deadlock can be very frustrating because it feels very damaging. But you might be thinking, I don't, I don't know how this affects my confession. I'm not the one who started it. Mm -hmm. I'm not the one at work that, like, I don't do drama. But here I am in the middle of this. What do I need to confess? Like, this doesn't make sense unless I do something wrong. And so I really struggled with confession for a while because I didn't understand that. But in James 5.16 it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So there is healing attached to confession. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because maybe it isn't your fault. I'm not telling you to take one for the team. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is that there is something important about confessing to God. Because at that point, when you can allow God in on where you're living, because he already knows. But if you can let him in on where you're living in your heart, you become fully known and heard. Mm. Because he gives space. He may not agree with where you're at, but I guarantee you he's going to understand. He's going to know where you're at, and it's going to help you as you move forward and understand where you're living and helps that internal tension. Okay? So, Knowing where you live, just kind of being raw and real with God, you know. And again, those conversations are better to have with God before you go to your spouse or before you go to your kids, go to the workplace. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes that can be more damaging because you're trying to work through it, right? But in the midst of trying to work through it, it's just causing more damage because you're kind of just externally processing. Mm -hmm. So external, externally process to God through confession. Let him know what's going on. When that happens... He can show you where to move forward in relationships because you can throw the best, and I have before, thrown the best temper tantrums to prove my point. I have, I have spent time with my favorite people that get me. I have spent time in counseling. I have spent time just sharing my heart with, with pastors in the past, and that is all great stuff. Guys, find people that know you and where, know where you live, but the truth of the matter is, they will never be able to move you forward like God can. Mm -hmm. There is something transformational that the power of the Holy Spirit does through that time that you spend and just letting God know where you're at, and he can take that heart turn for you and show you where you need to be going. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's just sitting on a perspective or asking more questions than trying to 
you know, make judgment on the situation because you need to move. The bottom line is you need to move. You need to walk through the tension. And maybe you're not ready to do that with the other person. So do it with God. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing. Stagnant, unresolved tension is bitterness. Say that again. That's good. Yeah. Stagnant, unresolved tension is bitterness. And I figured that out the hard way because, again, I'm, I like to be right. I, I don't want to get in trouble, so I don't want to be wrong. And so I work hard to not blow up at people or ignore people or, you know, like the typical Outside thing. Of the house. Outside uh, okay, of the house. Okay, that is true. <laughs> that is true. But I think bitterness is masked with anger and resentment and like that, that attitude. But what if in the inside of the recesses of your heart, mm -hmm. you're just at an impasse and you're just not walking. Mm -hmm. That over time becomes stagnant mm -hmm. and that becomes bitterness, okay? So that's where God really started stirring my heart with that. Confession to God to make known something that is wrong or damaging becomes a powerful tool in guiding your relationship to where it needs to be. Now, that doesn't mean it's fixed, just right then and there. It, it can be. It doesn't mean it's a transactional confession to God where it's like, oh, I'm done. I've confessed it. I, I don't know what else to do. No, what happens is it turns that time into a spiritual practice, a spiritual discipline. The more that you give space for God to work in and through you, that is going to see the impossible and relational tension made possible. Mm -hmm. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He promises to heal and move us forward. Mm -hmm. Guys, I had to walk this out because, you know, it's not easy, especially if you're somebody who dots your I's and crosses your T's, and that's why I'm picking on the firstborns, because I feel like a lot of times we kind of tuck in our good behavior, you know, or tuck in our bad behavior, and we, we keep ourselves in good standing. But the truth of the matter is, understanding more what that confession is about, it gives space for God in those quiet moments to just move in and through your heart. And in doing so, you might actually be feeling tension to the wrong person. Mm. You might actually be more, like there might be something under the surface that you thought was with your spouse, mm -hmm. but it just was easier to be dealt with in that environment because they're safe. Or same with maybe at work. It's like, well, this is the environment that I feel like I can be the most real. And so you think maybe that tension only follows you to work and then that's where you need to deal with it. But God is amazing. He is so transforming when you just bring an open heart to him. And he will, when you sit in that time with him, he starts to uh, let the things that are really troubling you start to surface. And he starts working in and through that confession. And it becomes a beautiful practice. Mm -hmm. It becomes a spiritual exercise of faith and trust in him, but of just moving forward. He takes that time, he heals you, and he moves you forward. So guys, handle your relationships well. You know, I, I, I tease and I joke, I'm like, we're really not compatible, but it, it is true. I love you to death, and we do have pockets of compatibility, and I love him to death. But there are times when compatibility is just not there, and I get frustrated with him. But guess what I choose every day? I choose to be spiritual. You guys, when you're raising teenagers, do you feel very compatible with them? They're feral. Yeah. You're not. There's things in life that are not compatible, but we're not going to take the easy way out. We're not going to go around it and let that impasse damage our hearts. That's good. We're going to work through it. You know, we, we don't leave our kids when we stop getting along with them. You know, we, we don't want to leave relationships just because we're not compatible. Let's learn what spi the spiritual practice of confession surfaces in and through our lives. Yeah, that's good, baby. Thank you. I know, like, I saw that shift in you a few years ago when you really began to just pour your heart out to God. I know there's prayer. I get that. 
But she began to do this practice where she writes things down, like very much into journaling. And, and really, like she said, making herself known before the Lord. And it just started changing the way we fought, if you will. It started changing the way we had tension together because she was beginning to know herself better because she was being so open and transparent to God. But then together, she could bring those things to bear. It gave her a confidence to be able to be postured in such a way that her head's up not just down with the tension, but her head's up and she's able to come and we were able to talk together. And I learned a lot from her watching how she was doing it because it brought me to the table with my head up a lot better than just fighting him with my head down. And, um, and she was able to really help me understand where some of her pain came from. You know, whether I caused it or it was third party, but it was affecting us in our relationship. It was bringing attention to us. And, and we actually went through that in the last week as we finished this sermon, wouldn't you say? Yes. <laughs> At one point, I said, no, we can't do this. We are not speaking to these people on how to get along. <laughs> it's just not <laughs> happening. Um, so I, I'm, I'm what they call a teacher or a coach or a pain in the butt. <laughs> no. So she's having ideas, and I'm like, hey, this and maybe it's a little... And it just wasn't going so good. Well, the thing that was so powerful was there came a point when she confessed why it felt painful to receive input from me through this process, you know? And, um, and that's something that happens in creative processes when you're working together with people. Tension, right, staff? When it comes to our creative design team meetings, oh my gosh, tension. But it's good tension, and it creates, it creates what it creates. Um, but I didn't understand where she was coming from because there was such tension. And then she began to go into something that she confessed to me Third part, something that she had experienced years ago when it came to some other people, other leaders that she saw. And man, it just crushed my heart. I was like, I, I, baby, I can't believe you're carrying that. that. That's what you're carrying to the table as you prepare this teaching. You're carrying that that was before you all those years before. And so her confession and that transparency to me allowed me to be able to get my head up. She was able to get her head up by confessing. And the tension just resolved. It resolved in, in intercession. It resolved in my heart being broken for her, carrying an insecurity all these years that was put upon her as a child, if you will. Does that make sense? And so that's the power of that confession, confessing to God and having your heart in the place it needs to be. For asking forgiveness or re releasing forgiveness to others, having your heart where it needs to be. So you get your head up. And when your head's up, begin to be able to deal with the tension at hand, because both of those things um, will work together to lift your head. Both forgiveness, the exercise of forgiveness, and the exercise of, 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 um, of confession will begin to lift your head. And that's so important, because like I said, when you have tension, your head, emotionally, if you will, it goes downward. It digs in. My way, my thoughts, my ideas, you know. My big picture, my picture, not, not the big picture, my... And, and it just, it's just automatic. And um, that slack line, you know, it just pulls the focus downward. And then it just leaves you emotionally shaky and potentially at risk. And so what will happen is we'll face external and internal tensions. All of us are going to face that. But I don't want you to forget there's the powerful, another powerful tension. And that's vertical tension. You have that external, you have that internal but you have a vertical tension that wants to draw you up, if you will. Psalm 43, David, he's in a place of emotional tension, and he says to himself, why, my soul, are you downcast? Like, why, why are you down? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Why are you so focused on all this stuff that your head's down? And he says, I'm going to put my hope in God. Another verse, and I'll finish with this, Psalms 3.3. 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. Isn't that how it is with a fight, with tension, relationally? You're trying to create a shield. You're trying to protect yourself. You're trying to insulate yourself. Like she was saying before, I'm right, you know? Or just whatever it might look like, you are trying to create protection. And this is saying, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. My glory and the lifter of my head. I love that. Don't be downcast. Don't let tension do that to you. Go to the vertical tension. Go to God. Lord, be the lifter of my head. 
And what's so powerful about that Hebrew idiom, that Hebrew idiom is literally speaking of the lifting of one's head is the favor that is upon that person. And so you know what? This tension, it may be unwarranted. Maybe that person's done you wrong, but they don't give me favor. I get my favor from God. They don't give me glory. I don't need them to say you're right. I don't need them to, to admonish me. I get my glory from the Lord. I get my favor from God, and he is my protection. Does that make sense? And so when it comes down to it, don't forget with your external tension, come with forgiveness. With your internal con, con, um, tension, go to God and confess everything. And as he begins to give you that power to be able to talk to that other person, you can be open with that other person from a place of health. And then finally, don't forget that vertical tension. And so what we're going to do is I want you to begin to think as we go to prayer, is there anybody right now that has ought against you? You know that that you've done them wrong. Maybe they're upset with you. Maybe you haven't done them wrong and they're upset with you. But think of mine. Is there anybody that you have relational tension with right now? And then I want you to think in your mind, is there any insecurities that exacerbate that? Is there anything in me that I need to go before the Lord and just, God, help me with this? Like Amy does it through journaling, you know? Is there anything, Lord, that's keeping me from moving forward with my head up, getting the big picture, so that God might resolve that tension. And I just want us to take that to the Lord in prayer as we close. Amen? Father, in your name, I come to you. And I ask for each in this room right now, whatever tensions we have relationally, that you would give us a supernatural ability to forgive and release. That doesn't mean we forget. That doesn't abdicate them from their responsibility. That doesn't look and negate the fact that they brought hurt, pain, and injury. But God, we give it to you because we refuse to exercise bitterness and become hardened in our heart. We choose to exercise forgiveness and keep our hearts soft and pliable before you so that you can continue to do a work in us, whether that other party chooses to change or not. So Lord, give us a heart to stand before you in prayer often and exercise forgiveness. Lord God, those things that we hold close, maybe things we don't even quite understand why pain hurts so bad. These different experiences hurt so bad. Lord God, help us with those insecurities. Draw those insecurities out of us that we might, like David, look to you as the lifter of our heads, I pray, Jesus. And we just ask that, Lord, the tensions that we have in our relationship, that you'll use those things, Lord God, to shape us and mold us to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give God some praise. Amen. 